Thank you, Gary. Um, this is the end of our second work, We Can Berlin, and the American Academy experience so far. Um, and my health has not been great through some of this period. Nonetheless, the, the, our experience here has been moving and unbelievable, and the kindness of everyone. Well, first of all, I'm honored to be a Holbrook lecturer. Um, Holbrook and I used to be occasional drinking companions in a place called the Lanes on the Upper East Side of New York in the 80s. And by the end of the evening, whatever problems he hadn't solved, I had helped them with. And <laughs> if, if, if I only could have remembered the solutions the next day. Uh, and at one point, he asked me to do a dancer drawing for him, which I did and presented to him, and he hung it up on his wall. And I was extremely pleased. Um, and I'm thrilled, both Joan and I are thrilled to be here. Uh, uh, the, the generosity of spirit uh, uh, which inspires one to work that starts with Gary and, and goes all the way down, Ulrika Grafton and, and, and uh, Linda Henderson's wonderful uh, curating of, of, of <laughs> the art I thought I was just giving to Gary to put in a closet somewhere. <laughs> and now it's all up above the walls so and you'll be hearing from my attorney. Uh, uh, but altogether, this has been a thrilling experience, and now I'd like to say goodnight. Uh, uh, I, as as uh, probably the senior member here, I was a child. I was born in 1929. I was a child of the Great Depression, uh, and I was aware of comics. And this is going to be an evening about comics. I was aware of comics from really early on. Let's see, we, uh, this is what you see here is, uh, this was even before my time, this goes back to the early 90s. It's, uh, the, William Randolph first put out a, the, one of the first, or the first color supplement, either he or Pulitzer, uh, the New York Journal, and color comics, and these things were glorious. They were huge. They were uh, remarkable in design. Here is one of the great cartoonists of all time. Uh, this was a man named Winston McKay, uh, who did a comic strip called Little Nemo in Slumberland, which was back in 1906 when he did this, an influence on every cartoonist and also illustrators at the time. Winston McKay never had an art legend. Uh, Winston McKay also designed the first animated cartoon called Gertie the Dinosaur, which if you see it today, and I saw it about six months ago for the first time, is as good as anything in terms of movement that you see in, in the more sophisticated digital age, and also far more personal. Uh, he was, you know, um, it's he was a genius, and it's depressing if you grow up as I did in the 1930s, and your ambition is to be a cartoonist, but not be a cartoonist, to be a great cartoonist, and then you come upon the greatest cartoonist who ever lived, or was ever going to live. And he was doing this stuff in 1906. So you've got somebody who you just don't even want to think about. And I didn't for many years. <laughs> I mean, if you see this, Little Nemo uh, is lying on his bed. Uh, he's fantasizing, as he always does. He's having these dreams. That was the story of each strip. It was like a little contained children's book of nine or 10 panels each week. And he's lying on the bed, and the bed grows legs. And then it goes outside and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, and, um, and there were actually is, uh, books out with the actual size art as it appeared in the newspaper at the time. And it's far more interesting than what you see up here on the screen. It's stunning looking stuff and so stunning a concept, the bed with that grows legs and walks around, that quite a few authors and respectable authors have stolen the idea over the years. William Joyce, the, the uh, noted children's book author, did a book called Santa uh, Calls in which the bed grows legs and just does all of that. He gives an ap appropriate appreciation to, uh, 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 to, uh, to Winsor McKay. Uh, so did the great Maurice Sendak use some of his uh, mm -hmm. and, and uh, acknowledging. He was an extraordinary influence. This is stuff from the time I saw it as a kid, re reprints uh, here and there. Here's another one. 
great. But the details, the, the, and the color, and the imagination, the wild, and yet nuanced imagination of this man uh, was so rich. Uh, and, uh, and of course, he was considered wildly sophisticated, and, and, and I mean, there's not a chance that he could have been published today in a newspaper, <laughs> much too advanced. Uh, and then he had, uh, ins uh, he, he inspired people like uh, the great German artist who came to the United States to work for a while, Lennon Feininger, who did a strip called The Kinder Kids, and then came back here to, to Berlin. Uh, and look at that. You know, just glorious, glorious work, and, and, and very, very reminiscent of uh, Fanninger's paintings, but I think every bit as interesting as his paintings, in some ways more so. Um, and then we move on into the 20s of the period that I was a kid, a man named Frank King and Gasoline Alley. This is stuff, growing up in the Bronx as a Jewish boy during the Great Depression, uh, where our lives uh, on the on every possible level, was surrounded by poverty. I mean, nobody had any money, and so nobody knew that there was money out there, except when you saw movies in black and white, and you saw penthouses on Fifth Avenue, and you saw music, the Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers dancing uh, on, on ocean liners, and you saw this fantasy world, and, uh, and that fantasy world, the world of the imagination, whether it was in a comic strip like this, where you saw this glorious stuff, whether it was in movies, whether in radio shows at the time, really became not fantasy, but basically an alternate reality for kids like me. Because the reality you were living through had so little promise in it. And yet the spirit of the time, and people had no money, people had, had, were lucky to find work. The spirit of the time was full of optimism because oddly enough, at the very time of the Great Depression, what was bursting through all over the place with new forms and explosive forms of entertainment. Radio, which had been around for a while, suddenly went coast to coast. And one could hear in New York the same program you could hear, uh, that you heard in Los Angeles, you know, different hours, but they heard the same stuff. And the great comedians who had their own radio shows, Jack Benny and Fred Allen and uh, Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy, they were broadcasting all at once to the nation and everybody heard the same show, and everybody was part of the same culture. They knitted together this culture in a way, and they knitted together the country in the black and white movies. Everybody went to the same movies. And so, in a curious way during the Depression, and then following in World War II, it knitted the country together. These forms of entertainment gave us a form of optimism. It just implied a form of optimism that wouldn't have been there otherwise. And as I saw them, these forms of entertainment, they weren't escapist. They were simply uh, directionals for my future. I saw them as documentaries about my future life. I would be. <laughs> I would be on those ocean uh, liners with Fred and Ginger. I would live this life. I would, and, and so did others like me. We just went in. We thought, uh, because our lives was clearly something that we were going to get out of. We knew this was temporary. We knew, I mean, nobody wanted to live in the Bronx in those years. <laughs> and certainly not me. But so I knew I was headed to either for Riverside Drive or, uh, uh, and, 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 and only living in a penthouse with George and Ira Gershwin. I mean, this was, it was a given. You, you just knew this was going to happen. And, uh, and if you were a kid during that time, the, the, what, the grown-ups, who in a sense didn't exist except as repressive factors. Uh, what, you, what existed for you was other kids and the forms of entertainment that you read. Uh, and in my case, it was almost all comics and, and books that, I mean, there were a number of children's books that I read and loved, but the real influences were the comics. This is a man named Frank King. Frank King did a strip called Gasoline Alley, which during the week, um, Every day uh, would show the uh, adventures of uh, Walt Wallet, the, the, the older man here, 
and his adopted son, Skizix, who was left on his doorstep at one point as a baby. And Skizix grew up over the years, but the wonder of, of uh, Gasly Nelly was the Sunday strips, which um, Frank King used to experiment with abstractions and to do all of these wild imaginative uh, plays. Uh, and you didn't know, you, you, each Sunday there was something like this, and nobody thought this was art. Nobody considered it was art. The, the cartoonists themselves didn't think of it as art. Uh, art was some kind of thing that other people did. When these cartoons were thrown out, the original work here didn't last very long. It, it appeared in the newspapers. The newspapers didn't save it. The syndicates who distributed it didn't save it. And it went out with the garbage the way the papers. So very little of this work still exists in its reality, and um, which is a shame and, and it's a crime. Here's another cartoonist whose name was Cliff Sterrett, who did Polly and the Pals. Also, the use of uh, abstractions and surrealism and wild colors and wild designs. These guys went nuts, and they went nuts with the cooperation of the printers and engravers who helped them get any kind of color they wanted. They helped them just create this world. So, as a kid, in the Bronx, uh, this was what I was looking at all of the time and <laughs> imagining myself as part of that world all of the time and drawing, beginning to draw all of the time. In addition to which, yes, this is Harriman, George Harriman, who's about the most famous of many of the cartoons of that period, doing the strip Crazy Cat, uh, which was also full of abstractions, imagination, wild flights of fancy. Uh, mm -hmm. And this was what a daily comic page looked like in the newspapers. This was a full-size page, a broadsheet. And, uh, and you had uh, several strips that ran about five, uh, five columns, large. I mean, you can't tell how big these things were up there. But uh, you know, when my father would bring home the newspaper at night, I would rip it open, open to the comics page, and devour it for the next half hour, reading stuff, rereading it, rereading, studying. And uh, I didn't just read the thing for entertainment or amusement. I was a scholar of the form. I was a student of this. So I would look at the work and, and figure out how it was done. Uh, what was the mechanism behind this? How was it written? How would you use the combination of words and pictures? And how would they be put together? <coughs> and it was always found. And then the, the creation of atmosphere, the creation of suspense. This was Little Orphan Annie, about which you've all heard of. And, and, it, and But what most people heard about Little Orphan Annie was how right-wing, how conservative Harold Gray, uh, who created it, was. But far more interesting and important was than Gray's politics, far more important than his limited ability to draw, because he couldn't draw that well. Uh, far more important was the fact that he could create atmosphere. He could create a mood and he could tell a story. And that's the whole story of the comic strip in those years. The newspaper comic strip appeared every day, six days a week in this form, uh, running five, six, sometimes seven uh, columns across a page, and large, and on a Sunday page in color. And, um, and it told a story. And it, was, and it was how these people, all in different styles, different approaches, told their stories, and each one who captured me and captured my imagination told, uh, I, I studied how they told these stories. I studied uh, what the atmosphere was like. It, it's, uh, I mean, this is very impressionistic. Up here, there's a little off an Annie, and yet you immediately know the mood, and it's, uh, and it's not officially noir, but it sure is connected to that noir world. Uh, and here's Dick Tracy. This is another man who couldn't draw, Chester <laughs> Gould. Uh, and yet he created an atmosphere. You, you, you immediately see the mood, rain, 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 a shadowy figure on the street. Our detective is walking on the street. You know that this huge figure is going to do something terrible to him. And it builds up. You, you, you follow as if it's a film. And that's what these things were, often. They were little storyboards on paper before we even knew what the word storyboard meant before Alfred Hitchcock introduced us to that, to that term. Uh, and th 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 this was the man who essentially created what was called the adventure strip, a man named Roy Crane, who created a, a character called Wash Tubbs and his buddy, uh, uh, 
as adventurous soldier of fortune and soldiers of fortune were very, very romantic in those years, the 30s and the 40s. Uh, and uh, because they went, they went on the high seas, as you can tell there. And, and what Roy Crane did very interestingly is do kind of cartoony figures and totally realistic backgrounds. Look at that water. I mean, he, man he managed to get that sense of uh, ocean waves and wake and surf. Uh, very, very realistic uh, in, in this one panel. And, and he, he basically led the way for other adventure strip artists who followed him, who in some ways drew better, but could never create a, 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 a better. Here's another one of uh, the characters running through a wood of a forest. And they're in the middle of a fire. And look at that bottom panel, the silhouette. And it looks like a scene run out of a movie. And beautifully rendered. So this stuff was happening in a daily newspaper. It wasn't art. Uh, the gentleman who spoke from the Metropolitan Museum a couple of weeks ago would never mention comics. He wouldn't deign to have comics up on his wall. And, when they, and the Met does deign. When they have an exhibition as, uh, of, uh, they tried an exhibition of Winsor McKay, it doesn't look, for, they have no idea how to hang it, or where to put it, and they don't know what they're doing. And so they, so it, it, so this thing that they doubt is art, when they put up on their walls, isn't art because they don't know how to make it look right. And they have no feeling for it. But look, this is glorious stuff. And what I love most, was the adventure stuff, the, the detective stuff. The, uh, and this is an artist named Alex Raymond, who later did Flash Gordon. This is a strip called uh, Secret Agent X-9. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and the writer of this strip, and often strips were written by different people than the, the, who, the, the, the illustrator. So Alex Raymond illustrated this, and Dashiell Hammett, uh, the writer of the Maltese Falcon and so much else was the the writer on this. Wow. And now what wow. he really wrote and how often he wrote it, nobody really knows, but his name was on it. Uh, and uh, uh, and oh, here. But the best of them all, uh, and the man I loved was uh, Milton Kniff. All right, let's see if I have this here. Uh, I had the text which I've lost, of, uh, that's too bad. Um, this was a famous strip. Here is, uh, here is in black and white. And, and take a good look at it in black and white, panel by panel, these characters walking uh, through a rather bleak mountain setting. One of the main characters has just died, and they buried her. This didn't happen in comic strips. And they buried her, and now they're walking away, having buried her, and talking about her, and musing. And as they talk, they stop talking, and there's silence. Uh, and this, you've seen it in black and white, here it is in color. And of this, because it's a Sunday page, and how much the color adds to it. So you have in the first panel, they bury her, and they talk about her. Her name is Raven Sherman. And then they run out of things to say, and they walk silently. And sits on, and one figure, Terry, is sitting in the foreground. Dude is in the background. But you can actually see him moving through space. And if you look at this, you get the sense as if it's a film of actual movement. And then they walk and they talk. And then they have nothing to say and it's silence. And you see it from a different angle, from a bird's eye view. And then you see them in silhouette from yet another angle, closer to the ground. And then Terry works away as dude, dude who had a romance with Raven uh, looks back at the grave because they're going around, they're not going to be able to see where she's buried anymore. And then they walk on and it's nighttime has come and you see the sky red. And then they fall asleep and, and, and nighttime is blue. And then the new adventure begins as they sleep, a the foot of some figure, we don't know who that is, appears. Is that a threat? Is that a friend? We don't know. But in 11, uh, two, five, eight, 11 panels, uh, you get what on film would be an eight to 10 minute sequence. And all of it evocative, all of it storytelling, it's the trick here. And the brilliance here is that these were lessons, certainly lessons to a boy cartoonist such as myself, in how you tell a story, how you get in words and pictures a form like no other, uh, 
how, how you dramatize events. It's different from writing fiction, and it's different from uh, doing a movie, and it's different. It's certainly different from writing a play because the use of di all these forms have their own rules, and the rules in comic strips were just as stringent. But uh, nobody paid much attention to them because it was a, 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 a form of a lower order, except for me, who all who just was like a Talmudic scholar of this form, <laughs> uh, and. Uh, and how you know, the passion with which I'm talking about it now is how I felt as a kid probably doubled or tripled. I mean, it just, it just ate me up. And um, because what else was there? I could go out in the street and not be able to play ball because I had no athletic skill and all the other kids <laughs> had. I could go to school and, and not do well in school because it was boring and I didn't like the teachers and they didn't like me. I could do all these other things which kept telling me that I was rejected or as a failure or I was no good. Or I could live in this world where I knew I was going to be a great cartoonist because I had made that up just the way these guys made their stories up. And I had decided that's what I was going to be. Not a cartoonist, but a great cartoonist. And, and I was about, you know, at the age of 10 or 11, I was almost as good as he was. If, uh, um, it'll take a week or two to catch up, but I'll be, you know. And it's... So, in a curious way, it's also what I'm talking about is the importance of illusion even when it's false. I mean, sometimes it can lead you to disaster. And sometimes if you just keep pursuing the illusion, some, one day you turn a corner and in a peculiar way you've made it real. What happened? I don't know. But, but there's some, it's, if you don't give up, it's extraordinary the things that you give the opportunity to happen. Uh, if you listen to the grown-ups, nothing will happen. <laughs> uh, and the other cartoonist who meant so much to me was a man named Will Eisner. In some ways, Eisner was more important to me than even Kniff, because Kniff uh, was an Irish-American coming from uh, 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 the Midwest, from Ohio, near Columbus, Ohio. And... Uh, uh, and there was nothing that he and I, in terms of our backgrounds, had in common. Will Eisner was about eight to ten years older than I. He was a Jewish boy from the Bronx. And, um, and he did cartoon, he did a, 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 an eight-page comic strip called The Spirit that appears as, in, in comic book form, uh, that appeared as a supplement in Sunday newspapers. And like Eisner's work, and I mean, like uh, Kniff's work in Terry and the Pirates, it was not really for kids. It was more adult oriented. He had real characters and he set real scenes and he had atmosphere, 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 as Kniff did in Terry and the Pirates. Uh, this is, he had these pages, these splash pages at the beginning, full of pretend, you know, wonderful logos, the spirit, and pretentious. Introductions and, and uh, <laughs> anyhow, when I was 16 years old and graduating from high school uh, and needed a job, I looked up when I terrified. I looked up Eisner in the phone book, found him actually listed <coughs> down of all things in an office on Wall Street in Manhattan. I went to see him with my samples. I walked in his door. I started talking of Blue Street. Uh, because I, and uh, he said, "Let's see your work." He, I showed him my work. Uh, I knew probably that I had a little bit to develop, and you know, <laughs> that, 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 that I was great. And um, he looked at it and told me, in oh, almost kindly but not quite, that I sucked and <laughs> that I had no talent at all. And now, all my life. I lived with people. I was used to living, whether at home or with teachers or, in a, or with kids on the street, with people who had a habit of putting me down. So I learned how to deal with that, which was to change the subject. <laughs> <laughs> that, that if I wasn't going to make it as a subject, if it was not a good idea to be talking to me because I was so <laughs> god-awful, then let's talk about him. And I began talking about his work. And he realized that this 16 and a half year old kid 
had a dossier on him. I had seen everything he had ever done. I commented on everything he had ever done. Uh, he had three guys working in the back room who were assistants. A lettering man, a background man, a penciling man. All of them were very, very uh, uh, professional. All of them were at the top of their craft. None of them gave a damn about Eisner. That was just a job to them. And I, who knew nothing and could do nothing, was in love with him. So what could he do? He hired me as a groupie. And, <laughs> and, uh, and as a groupie, I was worth nothing, so he paid me nothing. You know, just to hang around the office. And this, this, is a, uh, um, this is a scene from something he later did, uh, one of the graphic novels that he helped invent in this form. But it shows rain, weather, look at that. I mean, have you ever seen so much rain coming down? It's, uh, it's, it's, it's full of atmosphere, it's full of, I mean, you know, there's very little detail and you know exactly where you are. And this is what his, his brilliance was. Um, and this was his saying, The Spirit, and it was a fantasy strip and he hired me and, uh, and I actually had some trips. It's a takeoff on Dick Tracy. And here, 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 here. All these terribly drawn, uh, <laughs> inadequate looking panels were drawn by me. <laughs> the first work I had in print. And even I knew it was lousy. Uh, and he knew it was lousy, but we had a deadline, I had to get away with it. Uh, so he let it happen. But that's what I was doing for him. I was doing. Um, let's see what I was doing this other thing. You see all that black up there? That's, that's mine. <laughs> uh, not just that, but you see that shadow in black? A little more complicated? That's fine. Uh, you see the black on the clothes here? Yeah, that's, those, are, those, those, those are my signature blacks. <laughs> I did those blacks. And. Uh, so he had me do whatever you know I could do, which wasn't very much, until one day, in um, uh, in an outbreak of snottiness, I said the stories you used to write a few years ago for the spirit were so much better than you're writing now. Why don't you go back to being as good as you used to be? <laughs> Now, I would think that's a good reason to fire somebody, especially a snotty kid who had no talent. And instead, what he said was, well, if you think you can do better, why don't you write one? So I wrote one. I wrote one in his style, or what I thought was his style, um, the way he would have in the old days when I thought he was a better writer. He looked at it, he said, this is good, we're gonna run it. And from that time, I began to write First, every once a month, and then I became the writer of the spirit. I was the ghost of the spirit. <laughs> <laughs> and I wrote it every week. And, um, and my illusion was that I was writing it in his voice and his style and just doing his work. But then, as, you know, then I started to sneak in my left-wing politics, uh, which he started to get rid of, and sneak in some of my own stuff here and there. So slowly... Uh, you know, as modest as I was in my talent, uh, hubris was part of my gift as a person. And, and, uh, and I figured out ways of, um, of using it and feeling quite justified. And the, the excuse was he, wasn't, he was paying me hardly anything, so why shouldn't I be getting away with whatever I could? Uh, and... Uh, but it was a wonderful learning experience you know, to, to, to write this stuff. Um, but these were the adventure strips, and, and, and the other adventure strips also affected by Eisner's influence. This is a man named Harvey Kurtzman, who is better known for having created Mad Magazine. But he did these combat comics before Mad Magazine during the Korean War, which were full, full of realistic detail and re realistic storytelling. And again, it's atmosphere, atmosphere, atmosphere. Um, and that atmosphere led, you know, that, that one of the things, you know, in terms of escape, along with the comics, were the movies of the time. And something interesting began to happen in the 1940s. I had been reading 
over some time I was 11 or 12, Hammett and Chandler and, and some other uh, gifted writers of Rex Stout, who did the Nero Wolf series, and uh, a writer named William Irish. And, and, um, but then these movies, beginning with John Huston's Maltese Falcon, came out, which was an absolute replica of, 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 um, of, of Hammett's, uh, Hammett's story, and brilliantly done. And it affected a whole line of these films that started coming out. And I ate this stuff up. You know, it was the first noir, or one of the first noir films. Uh, and uh, where uh, the, the, you had a, a flawed hero <coughs> who was cynical, but we knew underneath the cynicism there was a meaningful and uh, a good guy who was there for the best. There was a femme fatale who was sexy and beautiful and who loved him and he loved her, but she was dad. <laughs> and, she, and she had to go down. <laughs> because a man has to do his job. And if a man doesn't do his job, he's going to lose all respect for him. So you've got to go to jail, honey. And, because I, I need my self-respect more than I need sex with you, I guess. I, it seems to be a very bad bargain. But, uh, and, and then it was the greatest of all, the Billy Wilder's Double Indemnity. Which, if So while loving these comic strips, I love these movies and love that period. You know, and, and, and clearly, I'm not the only one. I mean, they affected several generations. So this, this film I must have seen 15 times, and it never dates. Uh, and uh, beautifully written, and one of the writers on it was Raymond Chandler. And, uh, and incredibly conceived, and you see it today, and it's as good as it was when it was made back then. Uh, uh, along with that, yes. along with loving that stuff, I love Fred, you know, I still love Fred Astaire movies. This, these are, I started over the years doing my Astaire drawings. So long before I moved in the direction of noir films, I started doing these Astaire drawings and I've got my first Astaire strip to read to you. Let's see if I can. Um, it's my character Bernard, my strip. The one thing I should have been, I'm not Fred Astaire, but I don't have the talent and discipline to be Fred Astaire. So I do the next best thing. I tap dance my way through life. I tap dance my way through relationships <laughs> around my family, in and out of personal crisis. At times, I wish I could slow down long enough for some ginger rogers to catch me. <laughs> but one of them comes too close, I tap dance away. Sensational, but isolated, I dance on. The curse of Fred Astaire. <laughs> So these were the two poles of, um, of my documentary escapism. And, and, uh, Fred Astaire and noir and that world of fantasy that I wanted to turn into reality somehow. And politics, when I got into it, was a complete anomaly. Uh, the reason I didn't do adventure strips was because I, I, I only lacked one thing, which was the ability to draw like those guys. I could think that I wanted to be those guys, but they worked with a brush line and they did great detail and, very, and a lot of realism, and I couldn't do any of that. I couldn't even come close to do any of that. So, uh, and it was clear that I wasn't gonna be able to do any of that. And if I could have spent my life doing anything, it would have been one of those guys. So finally, what I finally got into doing satirical cartoons and political cartoons uh, was my backup position. It was order, I mean, that's not what I wanted to do. That's not what I was meant for. But I started to mature in my 20s into the, the years of the Cold War. And, and, and with my politics, I had a lot to say about the Cold War and I started commenting on these. But, but the truth is that if I could have been an adventure strip hack, I would have happily done that and not have had this career. I mean, I didn't know that <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that becoming a, a satirist and an artist was simply the second position I had to deal with because I couldn't be what I really wanted to be, which was look all, like all the other guys who I couldn't emulate. Fortunately, I got older. <laughs> and... Uh, 
Yes. I got to be 80, and suddenly I could draw something like that. I don't know how it happened, <laughs> but I began to fiddle with uh, the idea for a graphic novel, and I wrote it, and then I didn't think I'd be able to draw it, but the publisher insisted that I try, and I started doing these drawings, and because of my background, it begins in the 1930s with uh, a song from Gold Diggers of 1933 with Ginger Rogers saying, We're in the Money. <laughs> and it, it has, it's a two-part book. It's called Kill My Mother. Uh, <laughs> and I have to be clear here, none of it is autobiographical. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's... Uh, uh, and... It, it's... These kids are dancing, and then... There's, the, the dialogue later on is, is pasted in. It, it's uh, the, the publisher wanted uh, the art finished and then the, uh, the balloons, as we call them, uh, laid in after that, which made the whole artwork easier to do because you just draw a whole page and, and color it in, in black and white, and in, in, in washes, and you don't have to draw around balloons. So it, it went faster that way, and I like that. But you create a story, this is it, the cover, Kill My Mother. A graphic novel. Uh, and it takes place in a town, a mythic town called Bay City because if you read Chandler or Hammett or these other guys, every private detective had a town called Bay City. <laughs> Bay City was somewhere outside, a, a, was always a corrupt town. And this corrupt town was always somewhere outside of Los Angeles. Uh, and, uh, and I think Hammett was the first one. I mean, Hammett, who was a communist, uh, wrote a brilliant book called uh, Red Harvest and uh, about a, a town called Personville, which was called Poisonville because everybody was in it was corrupt. Everybody in it was on the take. And his detective comes in, in there, kind of like Bad Day at Black Rock, to clean up the town. And it was Hammett's idea of capitalism. And, 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 uh, and it was wonderful for, for crime writing because you have this one guy who, and everybody's against him. And he somehow manages, after getting beat up, and this going wrong and that going wrong, to clean things up. And the city was always, well, often called Bay City. So I have Bay City. And here's my private eye, weathered, beaten up, an alcoholic, uh, can't be trusted. And of course, he's glamorous. And his assistant, who's really the heroine of our story, and then I learned how to draw these, you know, how to lay it out and tell the story. It's all about, I had to figure out, I'd never drawn in this before, before, and I had never drawn in this kind of panels before. And I had never told the story sustained in this way before. So I had to figure out as I went what the hell I was doing. And it was a challenge. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, I'm 80, 81 at this point, and then 82. And each day I get up and I think, I don't know how to do this. I'm scared silly. I'm unqualified. What am I going to do? And then I start working, and I start having the time of my life, and it works. Each day, but, each, but, but the previous day's success never led to any sense that I could do the next one. I knew just to certain the next day that I would fill on my face. I'd fail. I couldn't do this. I was unqualified. I spent two and a half years unqualified every single day, uh, before I finished the book, and it was exactly what, the way I wanted it to look, and I could not believe it because I knew when I finished it that I was still unqualified. I mean, that, that, that this, uh, I have a, a cartoonist friend even older than I. His name was Erwin Hazen, and he worked on uh, the Green Latin for all American comics, and he, uh, a sweetheart of a guy. And we used to go to a bar in New York called the Cafe des Artistes, and we would drink scotches, and Irwin would always say it by, by the third scotch, I can't believe I got away with it. <laughs> and I would say, Irwin, that's what every cartoonist says. <laughs> because we were living like the kids we weren't supposed to be. You know, we were supposed to be grown-ups and, and living in an adult world, and, and we were doing what we wanted to do. And we were at play. This was as difficult as it was as many trials and error as there were, as many failures as there were. This was fun. This was play. I mean, it was hard play. Uh, it was difficult play, and sometimes you fail at the play, but then you went back and played some more. And 
until you got it right. And the sense of play with the sense of dedication is what, what makes me love the form, that's what that makes me love these old cartoonists. I mean, cartoonists, when you meet them, we have some here, uh, they're crazy. They are not normal people. <laughs> they are all insane. I'm one of them. And I'm one of the saner ones. And the, the, the real ones are a lot crazier than I am. And, uh, and there's something that is in them, some gene that allows them to, to go on doing with great invention the work that they started doing when they were four or five or six. And they get away with it. And they can't believe they get away with it. And they keep getting away with it. It's, uh, I'm sure you feel that way as a filmmaker sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> and here is, you know, here is one of the sample pages where I put the dialogue in as part of the storytelling. But it's, it's, and these are like camera shots. You know, where do you put the camera in the, in the comic strip? Uh, and there's the femme fatale. She's up to no good. You can tell from the beginning she's not a good person. The only one who doesn't know that is the detective. Well, the detective does know that, but he's, he's, he's a chance to make some money. So, and then I, who had never drawn backgrounds, <laughs> I didn't know what anything looked like. Started recording off my TV screen, old movies, and then putting them up. I bought a 65-inch television set so that I could have this Blu-ray image of this huge. And then I would push the pause button and draw 30s backgrounds from 30s films and 40s backgrounds. So since this 33 takes place during the Depression, I have my heroine walk out in the street for the first time after she's in the detective's office and we go through the streets and we see her experience and what she lives through and we see the homeless on the streets and everything must go and people hawking signs and, you know, and the, the, um, the atmosphere, a world that I had never drawn before, never gone near before and I had to figure out how it should look and what, and again, it's no dialogue. I mean, we, you know, that, that here and there all the way through the thing, there's dialogue and I learned from Milton Kniff and Terry and the Pirates and Will Eisner and the Spirit, will you shut up? Where silence is more articulate than having people talk. And here she is walking along the streets, and in the last panel she's calling her daughter Elsie. And that's the only time there's any dialogue in it. Uh, here they are running down streets. Uh, there's dialogue in this, but you know, I'm just showing you uh, playing with what the action is. And again, it's creating action, it's creating atmosphere. There's a lot of funny stuff that happens, which I won't go into. Running down the street, getting, you, I mean, you can get the sense of the flow here. Uh, all this has some dialogue, but not much. But you build up the drama, you build up the situation, and, uh, and it's, again, it's storytelling. There's very little dialogue in this page. Uh, and uh, but but it, but it's all very articulate. It's storytelling. Everything is storytelling. Here's what I always wanted to do. <laughs> I never drew cars. I drew a car scene in the rain because I never drew rain, and I had to figure out how to manage this technically, how to make it look not like every other comic, but somehow different. And you know, again, it's a form of play. You. you uh, Instinct takes you one way, and then that doesn't work, and you do something else, and then you do something else, and finally you get something close to what you had in mind. And what I had in mind is how do you make it feel, not like real life, to hell with real life, how do you make it feel, feel like the movie that imitates real life? Uh, and here's some more. And then what I always wanted to do, from the time, I, because I always loved action, and as a kid, prize fights were a big, big deal the way they aren't anymore. And I always wanted, uh, I never got into action comics or adventure comics, so I never did fights. I always wanted to do a fight scene. <laughs> and in this case, I wanted to make it look like a realistic fight scene. If you're really in the ring, not to make it overdramatic, but what would really happen and how they do it with the commentary. And, 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 and so I just simply, as I wrote this thing, I said, it's a 30s story. What do you always have in 30s stories? You have, I mean, noir stories. You have cars at night in the rain. <laughs> you have bar scenes where things go wrong and there's a fight. There's a price fight. Uh, there are guys with guns. I mean, these are the, you can't do the book or the film that, 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 
uh, 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 that the comic book is supposed to look like without having all of this stuff in it. So I played with all of those features that one knows because you've seen hundreds of these things over the years that you have to have in there. I mean, how can you do one of these things without them? They tell you can't do it. You do one without a gun, you can't do it. You do one without uh, 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 rainy nights. It doesn't happen. So I did all of this. Huh. And I'll just run through these. Uh, night scenes, street scenes, our heroine in trouble, uh, and shadows and how the shadows work. And again, the atmosphere telling the story. And then <laughs> the ultimate oh. car scene, hundreds of cars. <laughs> because by this time, I was getting a little arrogant. <laughs> and cars in the rain. And it's actually, it's one car moving through traffic, and the, the, each one of those balloons comes from the same car, which is moving sl forward slowly. So I kept figuring out how to tell the story uh, and do these outrageous drawings that I felt should go there. <laughs> now, often before sitting down to do the art, I would do roughs and fool with them, and I would do layouts. And then I would pick the page that I was actually going to do the artwork on, and I'd start doing something entirely different than I hadn't planned. And you let your mind go where it wants to go, because you can always do it over. I mean, there's no, you can't fail here. I mean, eventually, you're going to do something that's going to work. <coughs> oh, so the theory went. Uh, <laughs> And then using the lighting that you only see in movies, you know, the, uh, uh, as a car moves through traffic and it's nighttime, and the shadows playing on the part of the driver and on the part of the woman in the back seat as she's talking. All of that, nobody knows what those lights really look like in real life, but we know what they look like in movies, and movies are the reality. Uh, and again, atmosphere. Uh, and dancing, because that's what I do. Uh, uh, and singing songs, and anyhow. This was... More dancing. And atmosphere. And cars. <laughs> And, and that's the first airplane I've ever driven in my life. Uh, and it almost looks like an airplane. And a jungle, because it's World War II. Now that we've, we've, gone, to ten, we've gone forward 10 years, and it's a Japanese. And here's one of the characters in part one who was a kid, and now he's a, a captain. And they're building a set to have a USO show in which lots of violence is going to take place in here. <laughs> Here it's going on. The joining a dancing act. There's an attack from the enemy, and, we're, and people from part one start using the jungle fight to knock each other off because they're the evening old scores. It's so much fun. <laughs> uh, and that's it. <laughs> This was an incredible treat. The only thing I feel bad about is that you just don't go on for another hour, which I think is... Oh, well, let me... Uh. No, really, really absolutely fantastic. Um, of course, as a fan, I love your work. Um, as a colleague, I'm frustrated by it. So, um, What I love, when you talk about the process of doing this, you talk about the struggle. And of course... Like from the outside, it often feels like the struggle is just like, oh, it's difficult, it's difficult, it's, di it's difficult, and then you kind of like break the knot. What we talked about mm -hmm. uh, earlier uh, when we had dinner about was this idea of being artist and editor and screenwriter, and in your case, really choreographer on top of it. How do you handle kind of these different positions? Like how... Well, you, you know, uh, obviously everybody has... His, his or her own way and 
what works for the individual. I found if there were forms of work that I was addicted to in terms of the art form by the age of, say, 12 and 13, comics, all-time radio and radio dramas, movies, plays that I went to, that eventually I could figure out how to do them if I loved them by the age of 12. By 15, it was too late, I think. <laughs> but, I mean, fiction was another one. But, I mean, you know, but, but, but except that I could never write fiction except for children's fiction. Um, as in a way that I thought a true fiction writer. I mean, I didn't think I had, nor do I think I have the gift to write fiction as I would want to, as somebody who loved the novel from the time I was a kid. But these other forms, uh, um, I somehow knew I could stumble into doing because I kind of understood what the rules were. As a kid, I, I, not, only went, I not only would go to a pure entertainment movie, a screwball comedy like uh, The Philadelphia Story or My, or, or My Man Godfrey, but I would figure out how they did it while they were doing it and how it worked and uh, His Girl Friday, uh, uh, how, how they did these things, they, the suspense movies. I, th I was figuring these things out as I was watching. I was kind of analyzing and, and, uh, and destructuring. So as I saw these forms of entertainment that meant so much to me, I was also attending a university of my own. And... Um, and kind of taught myself by trial and error later on. How, so, I mean, if you're writing a comic, it's a different kind of dialogue than when you're writing a play. And you can't do cartoon dialogue on stage. I mean, people do. And they have hits, but they're lousy. And, um, <laughs> but if you're serious about the work, uh, and you see it as an art form, you know that you can't move one form into another without a form of adaptation. The same thing with the screenplay. That, that, that carnal knowledge, the film that I wrote that Mike Nichols directed, uh, was written as a play. Mike chose and talked me into doing it as a movie. And immediately we both knew that I had to do something about the dialogue. And so we had to transfer and cut and shape uh, the theater dialogue into movie dialogue, which is you know, what you learn to do. And he, he was a wonderful and gifted editor and, and teacher. Um, and you, so, so in, in a, as much as my work has been to defy certain forms and re-identify and, and reinvent certain forms, there's also a great respect for what the rules were originally in that form and how far you can go and how far you're allowed to go. You can't just write a movie as if you never saw a movie before. Yeah. And, but how much planning is there? Like when you, it's a novice, it's like incredibly complex. You have a lot of characters, so of course you can't just start on panel one and then just let it go. But on the other hand, of course, you say, like, you put these characters and then the characters do what they... Well, you know, the, the act of writing, which is endlessly fascinating to me, um, seems to work where, at best, uh, at the time that your head cuts out and, and leaves it to the characters to do what they want to. You've created the characters. You have a general idea of what they should be doing. But if you control everything, if all of it comes out of here, um, the results will likely be tendentious, uh, uh, dead. Uh, you'll get a still life. If you do enough and the characters start going their own way and moving in a direction they want to and saying things you hadn't planned, just as when I was doing the artwork in the book, the drawings, and I would do layouts, and I know what this is going to look like now, and then I start doing the finish, it would be different, because my hand would not obey my head. And when that happens, uh, I don't censor my hand, I cut off my head, and because I know that it's about the gut, it's not about the head. It's about wherever it comes from. If it comes from here, it's less likely to be really effective than uh, if it comes from somewhere in here. Where here is effective is in the editing process. When you go back after it's over, then you start thinking, this works, why doesn't this work? This almost works, what do I do? How do I fix it? How do I transpose? This would be better on this page, and this would be better over here, 
And when you start using your editorial mind, which is your brain, to fix up things that didn't work when you were the artist. But it's, it's um, but you can't have the editor take over from the start or it will be dead. Yeah. Speaking of like the head versus the body, something I realized when reading the novel, or looking at the drawings as well, was that we talked about characters that I sometimes feel, in your case, the bodies, as far as, far as the, the images go, are more the characters than the heads. Like the movement, like my, if I would have to pick one thing of your drawing where you say like this is just, like for me, the, the, the kind of the essence, it's the legs. Like there's like the, when, with the dancing, the legs, I look at them and I feel like they have like four knees. This is impossible, but they're perfect. They're just like, there's so much movement in them. Like when you think of your, kind of like, was there like a, in, in, in the work that you've done over the years, I've looked at some of your like very early comic work. We all start with drawing heads. That's I think the first thing any cartoonist yes. does. Did you feel like you were moving slowly from like facial expressions to, and then expanding into bodies? No, I was doing what was necessary. I was working in um, a comic strip form in a newspaper with its limited amount of space. I had to tell a story in eight, I mean six to eight to nine panels. It was often. Um, Complicated. I mean, I was doing grown-up stories in comics form, and they were about either politics, uh, or relationships, or family, uh, or dealing with authority. Or I mean, but they were they were grown-up issues, which I had to pretend were forms of entertainment in order to get past the reader. I mean, this, this was all sleight of hand. That I had certain things. I mean, from the beginning. One of the things, uh, the, as a Cold War cartoonist, um, one of the things that interested me from the start was how we use language to obscure and not to clarify. And um, my favorite of this is that uh, during underground nuclear testings and testing in the 50s, uh, some ad hoc committee was set up uh, by the Congress to, to, you know, and people, important people nominated to it to test to see whether all of those stories of leaks were coming out which the government denied, as cattle were falling over in Utah, <laughs> as John Wayne was getting poisoned in, 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 you know, in, in Nevada, making a movie. Uh, but, you know, so, and the name of this committee that was, that, that was assigned to check out the harmful effects of nuclear radiation of existence was called Operation Sunshine. <laughs> and, you know, so now, the, the use of language to simply lie to us has always been there. But we didn't realize, we didn't really, and, and Eisenhower used it and JFK used it, but it didn't come into its heyday and become um, officially acknowledged until LBJ and the credibility gap. I have a favorite story reporters used to tell about Johnson, about Lyndon Johnson. Uh, and was, it's, how do you know when the president is lying? And they said, well, um, when he squints his eyes, he's telling the truth. When he pushes back his hair, he's telling the truth. When he picks his nose, he's telling the truth. When he straightens, loosens his tie, he's telling the truth. When he opens his mouth, he's lying. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Johnson, who took over from JFK and passed the Voting Rights Act and, and, and the poverty program, did some amazing things in one fell swoop because of his foreign policy blunders in Vietnam, um, changed the way we look at government because people trusted government until Johnson. They believed in government until Johnson and the credibility gap. And I mean, it changed everything. So I was, so both in terms of politics, but also in terms of family, uh, in terms of everything, I was trying to decode the codes that we would, we would that we were using on the job, we were using in the family, we were you using in sex? Yes, that means no, no, that means maybe. Um, and, um, but doing that, not in terms of a lecture, I was trying to get difficult ideas across, and the only way you could do that is through what I consider a kind of sleight of hand. You fool the reader into thinking he or she is going from one innocent panel to the next innocent panel. Oh, this is fun, this is interesting. I'm getting involved here, and then the last panel, whack, and you got them. So this was, you know, something I taught myself to do, and um, 
over a period of years, and you can't do that and do interesting artwork. You can do one or the other. If you had complicated artwork and used a lot of body language and a lot of interesting poses and different angles, you couldn't you couldn't get them to hear the dialogue, and the dialogue was what was important. So I used outlines of heads. I used uh, just close-ups of heads. Yeah. I used facial expression, and the only thing that would change would be the facial, uh, the lifting of an eyebrow, uh, a little smirk, a little this, a little that. But essentially, the art had to be passive. Yeah. It couldn't be active as it is here, or I couldn't tell the story, and it was all about storytelling. I mean, in this case, a different kind of storytelling because I had a social or political or uh, relationship point to make, but it was all storytelling. And how do I get past the reader's resistance? How do I get him or her to listen to the point I'm making uh, without it becoming a speech? Well, and obviously, and you talked about that a great deal, that you cannot, and all, every, all, every writer knows that, every draftsman knows that as well, you cannot be a good uh, writer, if you're not a good reader, the same goes for drawing. The way you consume images obviously has a huge impact on how you work. But of course, it also means that you're dependent on a visual literate audience. Like the way you, like the sophistication and the drawings and then the writing, of course, depends upon a, an audience who kind of like knows how to deal with that. And you, like being kind of like in touch with what people can understand but you can't, or not. But you can't think about that or worry about that. Uh, you know, the question, who is this for? What's your audience? Once you start thinking of who your audience is, you're not thinking of your story anymore. You're thinking of the end result. Who's going to buy it? Uh, will it sell? Will it be commercial? Uh, shall I write my acceptance speech for the prizes yet? <laughs> um, you, know, I mean, you, you start thinking of all of the crap that surrounds the creative process, which all of us engage in. But then you get back to the fact that you're telling a story. I mean, that, that there are today um, extraordinary children's book illustrators around who draw and paint beautifully. But too many of them, when you go look through the book, you see that they're on an ego trip and that their beautiful illustrations have little or nothing to do with the story they're telling. And they couldn't care less about the story they're telling they, because you go through the book and on the left hand page is a text which is interesting and on the right hand page is this beautiful illustration that says me, 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 don't read him, look at me. <laughs> and, you know, and it's insane and it ain't art. As, as beautiful as the work may be, it doesn't work because it has to be a story. I mean that the process is complete. This text and pictures working together. That's what comics are, that's what ch children's books are or should be. Uh, and when it's a picture, um, whether it's a, a, a long text like the Phantom Tollbooth, which I illustrated years ago by Norton Juster, or a short picture book, um, the picture and the text have to become one, you, so that you're not aware that different people may have done them. But obviously, like your drawings, just by themselves, if you wouldn't have would not have written a line of copy in your life, they would be easily worth enough for you to be kind of like uh, 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 unique in the field. Do you find it, especially given your drawing skills, um, hard to sometimes keep that in check? You know, sometimes you have this beautiful drawing, but you know I have to reduce, like otherwise, like for, to kind of get this perfect unity. Is this something where you easily go, I'll just reduce, I'll just like, I'll cut it down, I'll cut the panel closer? No, or is it a struggle? Because uh, above and beyond anything else, it's, if I'm working in this form, it's my identity as a storyteller, that's, um, that's preeminent. And I, you know, it, it, and I push that button. Just as uh, when my kids were little and I was working at home, as I always did, in a studio that was next door to one of their bedrooms, and I'm in the middle of writing something, or in the middle of drawing something, and one of them comes in and needs something, or wants something, and wants to hang out, I developed a pause button in my head that allowed me to stop work and deal with them and play with them or do, what, you know, do whatever it took until they were happy and left the room and then, and then I push the play button and I go back to work. I mean, that, that, that you deal with the reality of the moment and your life and you do what you have to do to, in this case, to be the father you want to be, but also be the, you know, to put the artist on hold and then put them, and, and then put them back into play. 
Well, it's something that I find interesting. I saw out there in the uh, in the magazines that are out there. Understand an interview with with you and Ed Sorrell, uh, David Levine, um, all artists that I grew up with uh, um, admiring. And when I compared it with like a lot of the graphic novelists today, who I love, you know, like Chris Ware, Adrian Tomine, I feel there's a lot more restraint in the line. There's a lot of like a lot less personal flow that goes into the the drawing. Um, is that like the, this idea oh, of like? I, I'm not sure I agree. It depends on who you're talking about. I mean, one of the things I should have mentioned. I'm glad you brought this up. I think after many years of this field being very fallow and the level of talent. Uh, um, declining markedly, that the last 20, 25, maybe 30 years has seen this remarkable explosion and the level of uh, the, car the cartoonists who are working, the young cartoonists um, who are working in this field are on a level of talent that I have not seen since the day of Winsor McKay or Frank King or Chris Ware is one of them with, yeah. you know, with his extraordinary detail, precise, but at the same time, he's a wonderful storyteller. And he tells he's slow moving. Uh, I'm drawing a blank. There was this wonderful. Um, Jimmy Kerrigan? Well, the, the, yes, but the, the New Yorker writer who, 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 whose editor famously cut out everything. To, uh, uh, <laughs> so that the tales were particularly spare and sparse. What the hell was his name? Do you remember who I'm talking about? No, sorry. I don't remember who I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and who are you? Uh, um, damn, I wish I could remember. Anyhow. Uh, William What's that? Sean. William Sean. William Sean. No, no, no. Th thank you for trying this. Anything in Carver and Blish. What's that? Carver. Ray yes, Raymond Carver. Raymond Carver and Gordon Lish. I'm so glad I came up with that. Uh, well, I mean, that there is so much that uh, in um, Chris Ware's art and storytelling that reminds me of Raymond Carver, and, and um, uh, except it's it's more magical because it's this pictorial world that looks like no other, and in wonderful, precise tight detail. I mean, as far away from my work as you can imagine. Yeah. But it truly is works of genius. You know, one thing after another after another. And then there's, of course, Art Spiegelman and Mouse and his yeah. extraordinary, and, and his book on the World Trade Center in the Shadows of No Tower. Yeah. That first was shown here in a, no, no one would publish it in the States. Yeah. It, it got published in Germany, in Berlin here for the first time. Yeah. Uh, and um, and uh, David Small, who did an who was a children's book illustrator, does did a book about his childhood called Stitches. Unbelievably painful, unbelievably true, and gorgeous storytelling with a, a, with dialogue exactly right, and then long silences through page after page. Yeah. Beautifully dramatized. This le this level of work by these guys, Daniel Clouds. Uh, yeah. Uh, Bechtel, what's her name, first name, who did the fun, uh, fun house or fun Allison. home? Allison. Allison Bechtel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, just remarkable. Uh, so I think there is this extra, and um, Craig Thompson who did blanket, Blankets. Mm -hmm. This extraordinary explosion of young people doing uh, not action comics or Marvel comics, they're doing real art. It's visual real literature. Personal stuff. It's visual literature, really. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what it is. And, uh, and there were huge audiences out there. And I've met some people I've, you know, who don't read this form because they, it's not up to what they read. It's not literary. Right. It's, not on, you know, it's not on type. So I remember talking to an editor I met in Boston some few years ago about graphic novels. She says she's never read them. And so she's no point in reading them. And I brought up with the easy one, Mouse, because it got won all the prizes, mm -hmm. because it's about the Holocaust, which is how can you deny a book about the Holocaust that wins a Pulitzer Prize and this prize and that prize? She had no interest in it. Didn't look at it, didn't even consider it. Put. Now, Spiegelman's masterwork is not just because it's a book about mice who are Jews who are in the Holocaust. It's about the relationship between he and his father. That goes, it goes back and forth between his father's memories, which art digs out of him, 
and then and then his father and Art's relationship, which is difficult and almost impossible. And so you find that uh, when, his, when the family is in the camps, the father's in the camps, he does heroic things. And when he's with his son, he's a pain, pain in the ass, and you want to you want to kill him. And, and so so it's this juxtaposition of the very real feeling in families all in the shape of a funny looking comic strip which is beautifully drawn now that's uh, you know a, a kind of a miracle and it's a, and it's something that could not have been imagined 30 years ago 40 years ago 50 years ago it's just you know, all of this stuff is happening now yeah. and um and i'm sure that the reason i got into this now is not because of Terry and the Pirates back then, but because of the kind of work these guys are doing, and me thinking, screw you, why should you be the only ones doing it? Let me do it. <laughs> so, you know, I want to, I want to get in on this game, and, and so I, you know, it, uh, so I discover uh, at eighty-five, deaf and bro <laughs> broken in health, uh, I want to compete. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Well, on, on that note, I know we have a lot of competitors here in the room who I'm sure, sure like, are all extremely eager to get some questions out. And like, uh, so I just would want to ask you to uh, put a microphone for up here in the second row, please. Ulrich Kostlin, I'm, I'm fascinated by what, what you're telling, but I'm wondering, in your opinion, what's the future of comic strips, illustrated novels in the digital media? And how will the digital media influence the way in which, you know, comics or illustrated books are being drawn? Boy, are you asking the wrong person? <laughs> <laughs> Every morning when I open my laptop, my first thought is, when will the time come when I'm old enough that I can throw this out <laughs> and never have to do anything with one of these machines that I will never understand again? <laughs> um, that, that, see, in truth, I'm a 19th century cartoonist. And, and, um, and it's, um, you should have seen my work back then. It was terrific. <laughs> and and uh, I, I, I don't understand the digital world. I know some wonderful work is being done in the digital world. I have friends, a, a wonderful political cartoonist named Jeff Danziger, who is on a New York Times syndicate and does extraordinary work and extraordinary drawing. And when I visited him, we visited him in Chicago, where he used to live. And he had me sit down and try to do a drawing with a stylus on the screen, and I just wanted to scream and run away. Uh, it, it's, but he knows how to do this, and, and, and because he's a boy of only 50. It's, 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 uh, uh, but I don't get any of this. So I'm afraid I'm the wrong person to, to. One of the things I do know is that all of these forms, the political cartoon, which everybody says is dying, and there is a dearth of talent in it today, all of these forms, one way or another, sooner or later resuscitate. I remember when the theater was over back in the 50s. Nobody's writing any good plays anymore. And then somebody named Beckett came along and somebody named the UNESCO and somebody named Albee, and theater wasn't dying anymore. What happened? It was, last week it was dying. And uh, these forms that truly represent ways people uh, communicate and love to communicate, um, We'll have periods when they're running hot and running cold. The movie is over. Television is dead. Um, no more adult things in films. Uh, I mean, you know, you know, and it's, you know, movies are for kids. Uh, it's all of these things are true until they're not true anymore, and they all have their cycles. So you just outweigh them, and don't. And, 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 and as always, you don't believe the authorities or the experts. <laughs> They always know today's truth, and they extrapolate. I mean, one of the things that taught me about uh, the future and, and how to deal with it is that on one day in 1989, I knew that the Soviet Union would last forever. Uh, and then the next day, the Berlin Wall fell, and the world was different immediately. And But two days earlier, who knew this? 
And uh, I'm sure you knew it, but. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but that, that, and I found that sense of chaos liberating. I mean, that, that if we, that if, that the only thing that gives me faith in the future is that if we simply extrapolate what we know today into tomorrow and say it's bound to happen, we're doomed. So I pray for chaos, and um, uh, because we never really know, and we don't know what's in control. Um, did we know that George W. Bush would try immediately at the turn of the century to try the 20, to turn the 21st century into as much of a mess as the 20th century by going into uh, Iraq? No, we didn't know, and now we know it. And and uh, no, we know he paints. So, <laughs> uh, so of the. But there may be positive things that suddenly happen that, that will surprise us, just as, as the bad things don't surprise us, because we're to, we, we, we are here to expect them. So um, my final message to this room is believe in chaos. It's the only thing that will save us. <laughs> We have time for one or two more questions. Um, speaking of chaos, there is a period where some of us still remember where you were very prominent. That was the late 60s in Vietnam. What would you say now, what is that now, 45 years later? Uh, you were not a political cartoonist. But in that era, you were the most political cartoonist in the United States. You hold States. the mic a little higher. Sorry, you're you are not a political cartoonist. I don't think you would say you are. But in that era, you were the most political cartoonist in the United States. What were you thinking about and doing at that period? During Vietnam? Yeah. So to my knowledge, I was the first American cartoonist, certainly in, the, um, in mass media, who uh, was drawing cartoons against the war. I mean, back in '63, when Kennedy was sending advisors in, um, it's um, and then I was active in the anti-war movement. My, one of my favorite stories uh, about authority and expertise in Vietnam is that um, it was a given that when the peace movement or the anti-war movement would bring out some information about the war, the, the Pentagon uh, and/or state, but Pentagon would deny it, and Robert McNamara would say, as he said over and over again, uh, uh, we have access to information that you don't have. Which we, uh, and then the war ended, and the files became open, and it turned out that the information proved everything the peace movement had been saying all along. You know, and and uh, that was the information we didn't have, which would have made the case even stronger, as Dan Ellsberg proved in the Pentagon Papers. So it, it's, it's one of the things, that one of the lessons of all of these events during the Cold War years is you have to be very watchful about who's in, you know, about how to listen to the people in charge. Sometimes, actually, they are telling us the truth. Sometimes they are uh, responsive and responsible, and sometimes they're full of it, and you simply have to develop over the years, I mean, you can't automatically say that whatever anybody in charge says, he's, he's lying. And you just have to, I mean, you, it's a minefield that these times we live in is, and you have to kind of pick your way through it. And sometimes your instincts guide you well, and sometimes they're wrong. Michael. Michael Cullen, uh, very quickly, you talked about Johnson's la use of language was basically black is white and white is black. You didn't mention Orwell in that kind of context. You didn't pick up the first inklings of black is white and white is black, With up is down, you? George Orwell. Oh, Orwell, yes. And um, were you, you were certainly aware of everything that he was doing at the time. So I was wondering if you'd like to elucidate on the fact that people have been using language manipulatively for actually hundreds of years, and Orwell did it so very well with 1984 and with Animal Farm. And I'd love to hear 
your political ideas about your, the use of language. Well, in a curious way, everything began with Orwell. But in another curious way, by that time, I mean, in my 20s, I was devouring Orwell's essays, um, his stories, um, his experiences as a policeman in India, you know, all of that stuff, and homage to Catalonia. Uh, and of course, Animal Farm, which was extraordinary, and which I actually liked better in 1984, and meant more to me. But um, but this was, by the time we got to Vietnam, uh, it was also real that one didn't think, or I didn't think, in terms of Orwellian language, and this is George Orwell, or this is because that was a, a, a literary illusion in times that were so strikingly dramatic and so strikingly real, and kids out in the street protesting and, 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 and marching around and, and, and le levitating the Pentagon. I mean, all sorts of hell was breaking loose. So. I think most of us, certainly not I, was thinking in terms of how Orwell was right. We took that for granted, but it didn't help the conversation. I mean, it didn't help the, the, the debate because we, you had two sides who had nothing to say to each other, who, did, who denied, who had their own realities. And, um, and the difference was that in Orwell's world in 1984, Authority had all the power, and what we saw in the United States in the 60s, and I was at the, at the Chicago Convention in 68, um, what you saw is a government that, that, that was, seemed to be fast losing power and had lost control and couldn't keep its, its, its sight on things. I mean, uh, so there was no sense of a dictatorship sitting hard on you and telling you what the truth was, and like, because nobody was believing it. Nobody was taking it seriously. And, uh, and George Orwell didn't have to deal with rock and roll. <laughs> and, 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 